This video is not about global warming, politics, or pollution. It's about this. Cities have been around for centuries, and although the building materials have changed throughout the years, they all have one thing in common. They absorb shortwave radiation, which results in heat. If you ever walk through downtown on a hot sunny afternoon, then you know the feeling. If you've ever put one hand on concrete and one hand on grass, you know which hand is going to be in pain the rest of the day. This excessive heat within cities has a name, the Urban Heat Island, and it can actually significantly change the weather happening around it. Now, heat can be transferred in three different ways, but the two that matter the most in cities are convection and radiation. Radiation is obvious, and it's the reason you wear sunscreen. When sunlight hits the ground, much of the shortwave radiation is absorbed and some of it is reflected. But this absorbed radiation actually gets released as longwave radiation at night back into the atmosphere, which is why the ground naturally cools down. But because of the street canyon configuration and irregular geometry of city infrastructure, it's more difficult for this radiation to be released back into the atmosphere. Instead, it slowly warms the air directly around it, causing warmer air temperatures at night. Convection, which is the transfer of heat through the movement of fluids, is inhibited by increased surface roughness. Wind can't transfer heat away from the city efficiently because it gets pushed out of the way by tall infrastructure. So essentially, you end up with a dome of a movable hot air in the center of downtown. But not a problem, because you can just close your windows and turn on your air conditioner, right? Well, if you do that, your air conditioner will be generating heat outside of your room, which will contribute to the heat island. And if everyone does this at the same time, then it causes a spike in consumed power, generating even more net heat and leading to a possible outage. It's happened many, many times. Several studies have linked urban heat islands to be positively correlated with larger populations, which makes sense. The more people in a city, the larger the infrastructure, the more heat absorbed, the more power consumed. Columbus, Ohio has about a million people living in the metro area, and out of 60 US cities, it ranked the eighth most intense urban heat island in the summer. On average, it's 4.4 degrees hotter in the city than outside of the 270 loop. And in 2012, Jim DeGrand, a senior researcher in geography and assistant state climatologist here at The Ohio State University, measured a 14 degree difference between downtown and the Madison County line, so it can vary greatly depending on wind speed, air temperature, and incoming radiation. In the last video where I tripped in a cornfield, we were talking about evapotranspiration and how that can increase the heat index in the summer. But the reality of the situation is that's only such a small part of the year, and the net effect of evapotranspiration over a long period of time is cooling the atmosphere down. So when you think about it, there's not a lot of trees or soil or grass or vegetation in cities, which means that you're not getting that net cooling effect that evapotranspiration could have, which helps to fuel the urban heat island. So we know how the urban heat island works and why it exists. But besides making it uncomfortable, does it actively change the weather happening around it? <clears throat> Yes, it does. In a 2003 study, Atlanta's urban heat island was shown to induce precipitation in the metro area on 37 days over the course of five years, which is pretty significant. Another study showed a decrease in freezing rain events by 10 to 30% in large cities like Chicago and New York. And while these aren't inherently bad things, maybe even good things, I want to talk about Europe. The past month has been unbearably hot in Western Europe. It was caused by an intense ridge in the jet stream, bringing in hot, dry air from Northern Africa. And although it's somewhat typical, it's been happening more often in the last decade alone. And the resulting urban heat islands have been insane. London City Hall reported temperatures in downtown sometimes 15 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the surrounding rural areas during these heat waves. And people are dying. In France, during the 2019 heat wave, 1,500 people died, and in the historic 2003 heat wave, between 30,000 and 70,000 people were estimated to have died due to heat exhaustion. So how do we solve this developing issue of the urban heat island? Well, it just so happens that the most implementable solutions are also the most obvious. 
To increase evapotranspiration, we need more vegetation in cities. This could take the form of planting trees, establishing more parks with green areas, or even cultivating rooftop gardens. Adding large water fountains or reflecting pools can also help in downtown spaces. However, that is uh, very unlikely to happen in most case scenarios, but who doesn't like a downtown water fountain? Some people probably don't. One example of a really good plan is what Barcelona is doing, and they are planning to dedicate 30% of their city to being covered by trees by 2037, which is exactly what I think most of these major cities with insane growth in population should start doing right now. It's kind of amazing what covering miles and miles of ground with concrete can do, and it's both fun to think about and a real issue. I grew up in Cleveland, which is practically located on a lake, so we didn't really get the urban heat island due to a constant lake breeze. So it turns out Cleveland actually has a very intense urban heat island, but because of its proximity to the lake, you don't really feel it in terms of heat in the summer. A lot of shortwave radiation is still being absorbed in the summer, but lake breezes will often transfer that heat away via convection, so you don't really end up feeling it. I'm going to do a whole separate video about what it means to live by a lake sometime around December, so be on the lookout. And now, back to the video. But most mid-sized cities in the US and many major cities around the world are landlocked, so the urban heat island effect is much more prevalent in everyday life. And a lot of poor communities are located in these inner cities, so we should keep that in mind when temperatures are on the rise. Thank you for watching this week's video. Feel free to subscribe and share. It helps me out tremendously. And now for a very important message. Please stick around. Many students here at Ohio State University are in financial need during this pandemic, and many of them do not qualify for government assistance. So the university put together a COVID-19 relief fund to help students with food insecurity, rent issues, travel expenses, emergency assistance, just to name a couple examples. My good friend Anne-Marie had the brilliant idea to design a t-shirt of which 100% of the proceeds would go to this fund to support students in need. And so, without further ado, I present the Mirror Lake Yacht Club shirt. Mirror Lake is a small reflecting pool on the southwest side of campus, and there's an ongoing joke between students, faculty, and law enforcement that we're going to go jump into the lake. In fact, we used to do this every Tuesday before the Michigan football game, but the university put an end to that abruptly. But by purchasing one of these shirts, you are directly supporting students in need, and you get a really cool t-shirt out of it. The campaign ends September 17th, so act quickly if you want one. The link is in the description below, and thank you for your support.